Hello, everyone. This is Singing Lisa, and welcome to another Focus podcast. I'm excited to have you here, and I definitely want to say I hope you're well, you, your family, and your friends, as we all continue through the coronavirus and all that we can do to become better and learn how to uh, function in this life that we're living today. I'm honored to have with me uh, Dr. Muhammad Ashad. He is uh, has been our guest before and coming back to enlighten us and shed more information on what is going on in the area of mental health. And so Dr. Ashad is uh, someone who has been in the field for over 30 years and we're very honored uh, that you are with us being board certified and practicing psychiatry in New Orleans for that amount of years, you have seen some things and seen some people experience different types of uh, emotions and struggles. And so this particular time that we're in, uh, the coronavirus, we first started talking about how everything was so new and it was so fast and so quick. Um, since it's been about three or four weeks, what have you seen that has changed? Because we know that it's been shocking to the system, to the mind, and now that we are fully into it, what have you seen that has been going on? Let me say for the offset, we have talked about the mental illness before on this podcast. Today, we are going to try to focus just on the specific issues and the mental health encounters and the challenges healthcare workers are suffering. We are going to focus on the healthcare workers and the hospital workers who are dealing with the corona patients on a day-to-day basis. And like you said, I have been in practice in New Orleans area for 30 years. I have mainly worked in the hospital that included the private psych hospital, inpatient facilities. But let me tell you, I have never seen the mental health crisis of disproportion before. And that includes Katrina Hurricane. I was here in Katrina Hurricane and saw firsthand how it uh, affected the city and the people over here and the mental health crisis we saw after that. This is totally at a different level. And this is experience of lifetime. This pandemic has affected almost everyone in this country and especially the mental health workers who are dealing with the life and death situations on a daily basis. And uh, sometimes we don't recognize that they have the emotion, they have feelings. Yes. Mental uh, healthcare workers by nature, they're used to dealing with the stressful situations in the hospital. And they kind of keep this face of resilience and strength on their face, but they suffer from real problems. Let me tell you, I have spoken to some of my colleagues, some of the nurses and the doctors, they have described this thing as a war zone, literally like a war zone, dealing with the life and death situation. Some of the situations they're dealing with, they are, we are seeing in the general population, which comes with isolation, disruption of the social relationships, disruption of the economic uh, status, loss of job, loss of finances, disconnected from the families and the sports system, and this fear of unknown that prevails, this gloom and doom that we see everywhere. But some of the issues, they are very specific to the healthcare worker, because they are on the front lines dealing with the life and death situations. Yes, the life and death is the and most it, prevalent. Make, and not just the being fearful of the patient's lives, but with this mysterious illness we have, this invisible enemy we have, they are fearful for their own lives, contracting the illness, giving to their family members when they go home. I have seen the, the nurses and the doctors who literally have not gone home to, to, to their own places for weeks. They're living in the, the separate residences. I, have, I know personally a couple in town, husband and wife, both of them are physicians. They are living in different rooms in their home, and they have isolated the children away from them. This leads to early stress. And along with that, you see something else, that they, they have additional responsibilities at home. The kids are at home. They have to do their assignments. They have to be managed on a day-to-day basis. They don't go away for several hours in the daytime in school. So all of these stresses are piling up one stacking up with each other and leading to literally a situation 
where some of the staff members are coming up with the steam anxiety, the stress, it's lack of, I think the lack of the equipment which everybody is talking about has turned into a critical football in the country, but there is a real, in some of the institutions in the hospital, there's a real lack of ventilators we're talking about. Shortage yes. of the PPEs. So they are fearful for their lives. Some of them, they see the sense of betrayal by the system and by the hospital where they feel that they are not protected. It's like sending the soldiers to the battleground without body armor, without guns, without the supplies. So that's how they feel. It's a sense of guilt something that comes with the dealing with the life and death situation where you have to ration sometimes the care. And sometimes you feel you haven't done enough to save the patients, even if it's not in your control, but you still have the sense of guilt that you could have, do, could have done more to save the patient's lives. There's an anger involved. Anger in the sense that sometimes the patients will come and you feel that they have not practiced the safe social distancing. They might have brought it to themselves. Some of the, the anger, the guilt, the sense of inadequacy, inadequacy and isolation they have to deal with on a daily day basis is very real. And they tell you what they, they have done the study, even in this pandemic and the previous pandemics we had with the SARS, the prevalence of mental illness and the mental health issues is more in the healthcare workers than it is in the general population. Well, I know it's very difficult for them. And many have seen and heard, you know, the trauma that many of them are facing. They are used to helping others who suffer great trauma, uh, great shock. And now they themselves have to be functioning persons with problems. And I know that has to be challenging. And so there is a definite level of anxiety that probably cannot be described, as you said, because of the guilt, because of the responsibility, because of the work that they're dedicated to do. It has to be horrifying to not have answers, yet to still work with the best that you can. And really, how can they provide support, doctor, to one another when they're facing so much personally? Let me mention this before, and that they are working long hours. Some of these uh, healthcare workers are working long hours. They are taking continuous shift. But you need to not have feeling of anxiety and fear, not thinking that you're going crazy, you're losing your mind. Having the fear and anxiety to a certain degree is normal. It prepares you for the, to deal with the, the risky situation, deal with the real challenging situation. Accepting the feelings and having a podium to deal with some of those feelings and express those feelings and using your co-workers as a support mechanism, relieving yourself. That's where the hospital themselves come in, that they need to provide a venue, the team, all over the country and some of the teaching, the bigger institutions, they have a mental health crisis team. Yes. To provide a so-called a emotional first aid to the staff members, where they have a team to call, people to call when their feelings are getting more overwhelmed. They're yes. able to set themselves in the middle of the day, take the little breaks in a special area where they don't have to deal with the patients. Yes, I are. agree. I want to take a moment to share a hotline number that you have provided with us before for those that are listening and who may uh, definitely identify with all of these areas or know someone who can benefit from speaking to someone who can give some help. There is a hotline number that is available for you and the number is 504-818-2723. Again, 504-818-2723. 2723. You'll see that on your screen as well. And throughout our conversation, we will mention it several times so that everyone will have an opportunity to record that number and pass it on to someone who needs that care. And so, doctor, mentioning just the number of things you have, all of the hours, the stress, the work, the lack thereof, it really is becoming important for co-workers to lean on one another. And then for constant reminders, I would believe, of the life that was before, to know that this is, as much as it is intense, it is not going to last forever. But at the same time, doing your best is the one satisfaction to uh, take away every day. And just take one at a time. 
and patient fullness take one day at a time and recognize that this is a stressful situation. It's not going to last. I mean, like I said, normalizing the anxiety, but also recognizing when you are crossing to the limit where you might need professional help or talk to a counselor or a therapist or take a break. There's a limit where beyond that, when it gets incapacitating, begin to affect your functioning at work or begin to take you away from the normal responsibilities at home. That's where you have to worry about it. Another thing which uh, I, one of my colleagues told me that a lot of anxiety is around some of the nurses or the physicians being thrown in a position to take care of the patient they're not used to. There's so much mystery and unpredictability around the taking care of the COVID-19 patients. Some of my nurse friends have told me they would rather take care of a stroke patient. They would rather take care of a heart attack patient than to take it. And they don't know from how, how, what kind of term the patients are going to take it. They're not used to seeing a respiratory failure on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of the staff members have seen more deaths in a day than they used to see in months. Yes, that has to be extremely shocking to the mind and to the function that you're used to every day, just knowing that someone right in front of you just expired and that the person next to you is maybe next. It's very difficult because the overwhelming numbers of people who have come in for help have just not stopped in the line of the work that they've been doing. And I think it's been very important for them to have the breaks, have some time so that they can breathe again, catch their breath, see something different, and then come back to do what they are definitely dedicated to doing. Uh, it must be uh, just terrifying. And then just not having the answers. I think it's been a quick study for so many people because so many people's hands have been needed to help. So people have had to learn on the job, on the spot, on what to do. Even the ambulance drivers, those that are bringing them there, have had to learn very quickly signs to recognize, things to do that would help you know, the process. Um, what have you heard from people who have called for help and what is their most number one or number two concern or complaint? And they uh, uh, responding to that question, I had a nurse call me she said that she, it looks like she's living in a continuous nightmare. She cannot leave the job behind us. The situation is so intense and profound that she is having trouble leaving the job behind her. She is thinking of the ICU, the patients on the ventilator, the deaths, the bodies. They're beginning to have trouble sleeping at night, the stress, and some of the and, the staff members, they have reported that they are having nightmares, having flashbacks. And this is like real situation where you're seeing a almost like a battle for key. Similar to someone being in the battleground where you're in a continuous fear of dying. Yes. Continuous fear of uh, something happening to you or, or your family. The stress level, the anxiety, insomnia, the depression. And sometimes it can go to the point where patients are even having panic attacks, getting very isolated, irritable. So all of those symptoms go along with the, some of the anxiety and the depression and the, the emotional impact of this uh, pandemic. Well, doctor, have you seen a change in some of the people's reactions or conversations since things seem to be slowing down just a little bit? since more information has been learned and do you see a difference in maybe some people's attitudes or their personalities, their anxiety levels? Anyway, of course, we have seen some of the relief, but that comes with that and other whammy we are seeing. Because when you are actively dealing with the situation, you function under, under this fight and flight situation where you can use your feelings and anxiety productively. When you have a little bit of time to lay back, you can actually begin to feel the feelings a little bit more. You give yourself a permission. So you actually begin to see more anxiety on a delayed basis. They have done some studies uh, with uh, some of the healthcare workers who worked uh, with the SARS patient a few years ago. And it continued from the symptoms of anxiety, depression, isolation, avoidance, hypervigilance, nightmares and flashback. It continued to linger for years and years after the actual encounter with the stress. And uh, 
So what I'm saying is not something you have a quick fix available. By no means it's a sprint, it's a marathon which will continue to affect the healthcare workers and population in years to come. Well, Dr. Ashad, let me ask you uh, for from your personal point of view, I know that you have talked to many people, seen a lot of different types of stress and anxiety amongst the coworkers and the staff, our frontline uh, heroes, we want to definitely call them. How have you yourself been affected by working with your other colleagues? What has been the difference in how you approach the help that you lend out or give out to those in need? First of all, it's a kind of brought to the forefront the tremendous admiration I have profession for my colleagues, how they have put their lives on the line to help others. I have personally affected in a way, actually, one of my psychiatrist colleagues currently is isolated with corona, which he contracted apparently from a patient. One of my classmates from medical school is, as we speak, is on the ventilator in a hospital, trying, fighting for his life. So I have been affected. And of course, say, when you're a doctor, you, your circle mostly is a, of the medical and the healthcare workers. The all around it, how it has affected it. It has a general sense of gloom, doom, fearfulness, desperation, uncertainty, and anxiety, which, which is almost, you can spell people in the air. Do you find that for years to come, this will be a conversation and a discussion, and I'm sure many will be seeking help when they may not right now think they need it. They may be thinking that they're handling everything, and so there will be that day when someone comes to the shocking reality that they need to speak to someone. Uh, what do you advise that person, or maybe people who live with that person, what should they look for? How should they approach that person? Just there's no magic one sign or a litmus test to know when the person is going over the hill or over the limit. Generally, sometimes the, your, your loved one is continuing to say, You don't look, we can tell you're not your normal self. You are not there, you're not with us. You look preoccupied, your concentration is less. You look a little bit more impatient and disconnected. You're irritable. You begin to have trouble sleeping. And sometimes you will see the patients themselves, they begin to experience the physical signs of anxiety. That's when it turns into clinical anxiety disorder when you begin to feel that they, you are having these episodes where you are getting shaky, you're sweating, you feel hot, you have trouble, you hyperventilate, your heart begins to pound fast, the walls are closing on you, and you have this sense of impending doom you feel. And sometimes you feel nauseated. I have seen the patient with a mix of anxiety actually had bouts of throwing up, vomiting. So you, it can be psychological and also physical. Some of the patients would describe anxiety in the panic attacks like you are having a real heart attack. I can imagine. You have to be cognizant. And sometimes there's a very thin line in a large majority of the patients who suffer from anxiety, they also have depression around them, where you begin to see that you are very sensitive, you're isolated, you're crying a lot, your energy level and motivation is going away. You don't see the sense of pleasure from the normal activities which you used to enjoy before. And the tragedy of this pandemic is that some of the sports system and the outlets we used before like going to a ball game, having a football party, going to a movie, those things are also have been taken away from us. So we have to see the alternate means of getting the sport and using the sport system. It will definitely be a time of relearning on many, many levels in many ways uh, in every single area of our lives. And so for some of the ones that you have spoken to, has there been a particular question or concern about how they should explain a pandemic to their children? The children, of course. Uh, first of all, you have to gauge it what the children can grab. A child of four, five years is not the same as 10 years. So you have to gauge it where they are. Tell them the news that there's something going on, but you don't have to explain the full extent of the illness with them. And uh, address 
encourage them to talk about their fears and anxieties. Sometimes they might have the fear, especially I'm talking about the, the, the healthcare workers, that when you're staying away from them, they have a fear that they might lose you forever. Or you might not love, you don't love them, you don't care about them. They need to be reassured on a regular basis that you are there. You still care about them, to love them, and this will pass. This is not going to last for forever. Yes. And do you find that persons who would normally enjoy being alone, they may have a different view of that and they may want to still be alone, but should that be something that others should pay attention to? Because sometimes when you're alone, you are lost in your thoughts and you get pulled back into the trauma of everything that's going on. So that can be a thin line between which way is right or wrong with that. Yeah. Yes, and respecting your privacy. Some people are built differently where they like their own company and they like staying by themselves. But there's a difference between being alone and being lonely. Physical distances that does not have to translate into the psychological distance in the feeling lonesome. Yeah. That's where it in. we are all social animals. Yeah. We need other people to talk to. We need the connection. And you can use some of the digital media to make that connection. I have the patients who are talking uh, to the group of people on a daily basis on, uh, on Zoom, on FaceTime, on Google Duo, where they, that's the way they have found a connection to stay connected. And sometimes that's what another thing you need to watch, that watching the news 24 hours a day. Yes, is thank you. Information overload you have. You will get the bad news, the bad news, trust me one way or the other. You don't have to watch it 24 hours a day. You don't have to keep, keep a count of the cases in the country and how many people have died on a daily basis. What I advise my patients, that uh, limited time, fix a time in the daytime to watch the news and get the news. And get the news from the reliable sources, not from the Twitters and the social media with a lot of rumors are, uh, are flowing, floating around. Another thing which I tell my patient that turn the TV or any kind of stimulation from outside off one hour before you sleep. Very so you good. Sleep. Yeah. I, I'm and so it, glad you said course, that. Uh, of course, the practicing some of the other normal things that we have. I mean, having a little space to walk, yeah, having a little space to relax, meditation, mindfulness, exercise. Those things are important in our lives, which you have tendency to get away. I am so glad you said those things because that has been a direct line of tension and anxiety. People who just don't want to turn away from the news. So the focus has really been great to see. Well, I'm sure that the frontline workers appreciate all of the efforts of the community of many different groups who have decided to make their own masks and bring that to them and bring them food and bring them comfort. Some of the things that they don't get to do because they don't get to go to the store. They don't get to go where we are out here going because they're taking care of lives and saving lives and providing that hope that people need. So I know it's been reassuring for people to know that people from the outside appreciate them. And this is the time to give back and yes. pay for like they call it, call it. And they, one group of people we continue to forget, not just the nurses and the doctors who are taking care of the patient, people who are working in the background, the lab technician, the sanitation workers in the hospital, the, the, the people who are doing the laundry, the food service department, the ambulance driver, the runner, the people who are drying the blood. We continue to forget those people, mm -hmm. that those people are really fearful of their lives and they're under tremendous amount of stress. Yes. Uh, one bit of information I learned uh, from listening to information being given is that in the long run, much or even now, many of the people who are dealing with COVID-19 are actually having to recover at home. So a lot of the emergency care that is happening at the hospitals and the life-threatening levels that are being uh, attended to, much of the care 
is also happening at home because they're not suffering from the worst cases. And so a lot of the care at home also is very stressful because you're having to still practice the same distancing, the same uh, sanitation care. Uh, so you're still having to put all of that into place. That's another area of tension and concern. Let me say this, the mental health system in this country is grossly understaffed and very flawed. It's, it's stigmatized. Access to the mental health care is a limited. I was just reading when I came in over here that in Texas, even before uh, Corona epidemic, out of the 254 counties, 185 counties don't even have a single psychiatrist. Wow. That was shocking to really see that. And they dealing with the physical part of uh, this uh, corona ep epidemic, pandemic, it, it looks like a mental health has taken the side, so it is on the sidelines. Hopefully in some way we will realize that mental illness need to be in the, and the dealing with the mental illness should be in the forefront. We should be proactive, not deal with it only when the crisis comes. Yes, I totally agree and want to give uh, that phone number once again. It is a hotline available to anyone who would need someone to speak to, need some direction or guidance. It is 504-818-2723, 504-818-2723. I'm glad you mentioned the disparity or the lack of help and support and recognition in mental health because everybody at this point, because the entire world has been affected by a pandemic, needs some mental health care. <laughs> because on some level, every one of us has been affected. And that brings me to the next topic that they had a cool foundation here. We are trying to do a little more than the heart. We mentioned the hotline is available 24 hours a day and they start by the licensed uh, professionals. But we are also starting a weekly sport group virtually for the healthcare workers. Healthcare workers were having issues dealing with anxiety, the stress, the other mental health issues. That free self-help group will be started by myself and Dr. Lee Matthew. In addition to that, what we have done we are starting a free virtual mental health clinic at our Akula Foundation, which will be staffed by myself, Dr. Padmani Nagarat, and a good friend of mine in, uh, in Texas, Dr. Professor Hussain. We'll have three board certified psychiatrists providing the free assessment and the treatment to the healthcare workers who are encountering the mental health issues related to Corona pandemic. Well, that is good news. And I do believe out of all of the tragedy, there always is a, a sign of hope because new things have been learned, new techniques, new ways, new recognitions and realizations of the help that is needed from everyone. There is something that everyone can do. And Dr. Ashad, we appreciate all that you are doing along with your colleagues and being there in front so that you can firsthand provide the help and the helping hand that people need. We appreciate you and we thank you for taking time to share this information. And we will be sharing all of the updates that you give us and the phone number and the support group so that anyone listening uh, who would need some type of help would know that help is available 24 hours a day, but not only now, in the future uh, days and months to come. So you stay safe, doctor. Thank you for your continued help and support. And we appreciate your time. The Akula Foundation, founded in 1994 by Dr. Shiva Akula, is the nonprofit foundation of Canon Hospice Foundation. Originally dedicated to providing hospice care to the indigent community, the vision and mission of the Akula Foundation envisions recovery from grief and loss through innovative programs for the community, providing compassion, professional support, continuing education, remembrance therapy, chronic illness, and palliative care services. Individuals in Louisiana and Mississippi, as well as patients and families of Canon Hospice, also benefit from these services and more. 
More information about other programs providing great benefits, such as Camp Swan, a children's bereavement camp, offering three yearly gatherings, grief support, continuing education, and advanced illness management programs can be found at www.akulafoundation.com. Akula Foundation can also be found on Facebook at Akula Foundation and contacted at 504-818-2723. The Akula Foundation relies on donations from the community. Consider Akula Foundation in your next tax-deductible donation, online or by mail. The Akula Foundation is available for you.